had a next door neighbor that lived behind me, a girl named Arlene. And um, she turned me on to the Beatles playing, she had 45s. And she used to play this stuff and I just remember hearing like, um, you know, she loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, Hard Day's Night, Ticket to Ride, like all these 45s that she had. And I, I don't even know what it was, but something when I heard them, like something clicked, like I really just liked listening to that stuff. And then, um, then I actually saw, like there was a rerun, I guess, um, of the Ed Sullivan show. And they had all these different appearances of the Beatles throughout their career. And I just remember seeing all the girls and the excitement around around the band and I was like fuck this is like this is awesome I don't know what I'm seeing right now but it was I remember as a kid going wow this is really powerful you know so I immediately started um, trying to get like 45s my mom had an extensive record collection and I just kind of hang out and sing around the house and um, tap on stuff. I always had a lot of energy when I was a kid, so I'd like tap on things and sing and whatever. So um, I think when once I saw the Beatles, I was kind of, there was a bug, a bug planet. And then um, I got my first guitar. Um, I, I was probably about eight. Um, and it was weird. I, I think my parents did it for their, like cover both sides of the spectrum. But I got two Christmas gifts one year, and I ran downstairs, and um, there was a small box and then a big box. So I obviously I opened the small one first, and um, I got a microscope. I opened it. I don't think I ever used it after that. And then I went over to the bigger box, and I opened it, and I got a acoustic, a Sears Silvertone acoustic guitar. And um, I just started bashing on that thing and standing in front of a mirror and trying to do all the poses, the Elvis poses and all that stuff and tortured my parents for a while. And then they put me in a cap, I was going to Catholic school, so they put me in, uh, they put me in guitar lessons. I was being taught by a nun, which was obviously really fun. Um, and, um, but I learned enough to be able to like, I, I knew like all the chords so then at that point I would just I quit because the nun was teaching me like Kumbaya and Michael wrote the boat ashore and but I learned just enough to be able to figure out chords and notes and things like that so then I started buying records and just really diving into the Beatles Simon and Garfunkel and just trying to teach myself songs and then at that point I was hooked my mom either had a record collection that, that was always on, or, you know, back then it was FAM radio. So she was listening to stuff on the radio all the time. And I, I remember hearing stuff by, like, uh, uh, you know, I mean, there was the obvious, like, the Glenn Campbells and the Frank Sinatras and all that other kind of stuff that my mom and dad listened to. But my mom all, would also listen to stuff like the Raspberries. A good song was a good song. So she would you know, uh, listen to the AM radio all the time. and um, So I remember picking up other songs or other bands, like even Badfinger. I was really into Badfinger and didn't even know who Badfinger was. Like, I just I just remember hearing certain songs going, oh, I really like that. Nielsen. Um, and I just, I just, I don't know, I came up, became a little bit of a sponge with that stuff. And then she got me Abbey Road and then I really started to teach myself. Uh, I, I started buying Beatles records and I taught myself Hey Jude, um, Oh Darling, something. Like I just started learning these songs and I would just sit around and I was like the monkey at that point. Like my parents would pull me out at, at parties and I'd sit on the floor and play for all my aunts and uncles and cousins. and. Um, but it was like all Beatles tunes, the monkeys we were talking about earlier. I'd play I'm Not Your Stepping Stone. Um, what was the other one? House of the Rising Sun was, a, you know, that was one of my my early hits. Um, and I just, I just 
kept, you know, at that point it was just more about acoustic stuff. And then I finally got, I think I was maybe 12, 11, 12 years old. My dad finally went out and got me a little, um, little tube amp. It had like one 12 inch speaker in it. And then I got a Sears Silvertone electric guitar. And, um, God, I, I, yeah, I want to say I was maybe about 12 years old. And then I, my mom and dad separated. I went and I lived with my dad for a little bit. And I joined this band. I was maybe 12, 13. Um, and there was a band around the corner from my dad's house that used to play like mall openings and parties and keggers. And they were called Street People. And they started turning me on to the David Bowies and the Led Zeppelin and, and uh, Jethro Tull, like all this great stuff that was happening at the time. And then <clears throat> at that point, I, I was gone. I'm, I'm gone and I'm never coming back. <laughs> so it was pretty cool. The street people who started turning me on, and the guy's name was uh, Jimmy Kosnicki. And I used to sit in front of their house and just listen to them rehearse. And um, God, I think at that point they were doing, um, I mean, they were doing all this like Crosby, Stills, Nash and & Young. They were doing Jethro Tull. They were doing uh, Deep Purple. Um, Zeppelin they turned me on to. And, um, and then it was weird. He came out of the house one day and I was just sitting on the step and and I just struck up a conversation with him and he said, oh, you play? And I said, yeah, you know, so they took me in and I went up jamming a song or two with them. And then they hired me to join their band. So all these guys were like 17 or 18 and I'm like 13 or 12, whatever. So I was like this little midget in the band. And, um, you know, so I would do, uh, God, what songs did I sing? I sang Nights in White Satin. That was the Moody Blues. Um, Heart of Gold by Neil Young, um, House of the Rising Sun, I did I'm Not Your Stepping Stone with them, This Boy by the Beatles, and you know, so it was like, I was kind of like this little novelty thing, they'd shove me out in the front for a minute and I'd go sing and everybody would go, oh look how little he is, and I'd play these tunes and um, so I joined that band and then uh, they eventually kind of came came apart and or fell apart and then um and then I at that point I was like man I love doing this I love being in front of the audience so then I just started looking for different people in the neighborhood to jam with and and uh, that's when I met my you know my uh, ex-wife Valerie uh, I was in a band with her brother that's how I met her I found him and he was just like this incredible guitar player and uh, you know, so then him and I started putting different versions of bands together, and it was pretty cool. And I mean, I was still in, I don't, I don't even think I was in junior high yet, so I was still in like grade school, you know, seventh, eighth grade, whatever. We used to do like the typical dances, you know, high school dances or talent shows and um, mall openings, whatever we could find. You know, we weren't old enough quite yet to play in the clubs in Philadelphia, New Jersey. So I know we were, we were definitely under 16, 17 years old. We couldn't even perform in the clubs. We were too young. But we were doing all this awesome Zeppelin, Rod Stewart, um, Kansas, like whatever. Whatever was Skinner was a big one. Um, you know, so it was, it was cool. It was a lot of fun. I was in a bunch of different versions, you know, it was so hard to have a band, you know, everybody was really young, immature, you know, we'd fight about things and it'd be like, F you, I quit, you know, whatever. And, um, you know, so keeping one of those bands together was very difficult. Um, but I, I, I basically started, you know, the whole bar mitzvah, birthday party, weddings, uh, mall openings, school, party, whatever, and we graduated to, um, 
God, where did we, we, we started eventually, we got to the point where we were old enough to start playing in the clubs. So at that point it was four sets a night, cover songs. And uh, I did that, man, from, God, I was probably 17, 18 years old. I probably did that for three or four years all through Philadelphia, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, New York, whatever. And um, I, it was funny. I made a, I, uh, you know, at 18, I was, uh, I was making a pretty good living. I was, I was, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm talking the 70s. You know, I was probably making five, six hundred bucks a week cash. You know, back then that was really good money. And um, you know, but I, I, something. It was weird. I knew that if I really wanted to be like my heroes, that I needed to write my own music. But there wasn't a lot of places in Philadelphia at the time to do that. So, uh, I mean, the band, you know, all these different bands, I'd gone through like, you know, 500 different people that I played with. And I had a band with Johnny D. Um, and it was uh, a couple of the guys that actually from the band Angora, Jimmy and Frank, myself and Johnny D. And we were playing somewhat regularly. But we were trying to do originals, and uh, Johnny went to California on a vacation, and he came back, and he said, dude, we have to go to California. I was out there, he goes, everybody's walking around with palm tree hair, and he goes, every club in California you can play original music in. That's when the Starwood, Roxy, Whiskey, like all those places were going. So I went out with my wife at the time. Uh, I went out for uh, like an anniversary and we checked it out and we were sold. Yes. I mean, I saw all this great shit, like the rainbow and you've been there, you know I mean? It's like unbelievable. And um, so I went and I did that and uh, came back and I told all the guys in my band, I go, I want to move to California. I want the whole band to move out there. Um, so that we all agreed. The bass player, Frank, moved out first. I moved out second. Then Jimmy moved out, the guitar player. Johnny was supposed to come, but then he, he changed direction and wound up putting a band together with uh, Dean Davidson, which eventually became Britney Fox. But, um, so we brought this other guy out from Philadelphia, Robert, and we started a band called Angora. And, um, you know, did the whole thing, ticket, you know, selling tickets for shows, like the whole pay, pay to play thing. And we were actually doing pretty good though. We were one of the, one of the bigger bands in LA at the time. And, but the band started to get a little off track with drugs. Everybody was like partying and the band was starting to implode. Um, so this gentleman that I had, uh, I had spoken with about management, he had this idea of taking um, myself and pairing me up with, uh, uh, after, the, after the, my band from Philadelphia imploded, whatever, he had this idea of pairing me up with uh, Juan Alderetti, Bruce Bouillet, and Scott Travis from Racer X and then put us together, um, which we did. We immediately started writing, and then uh, Scott Travis wound up getting the Judas Priest gig, so he bailed and did Painkiller. So then we brought in this guy named Walt Woodward, um, and we just started writing and recording, and this uh, Hollywood, we set up a showcase with Hollywood Records, and uh, once word got out that we were showcasing for them, it's that, that thing like one record label shows interest, then they all show interest. So we wound up doing about 10 showcases in, in like a week, week and a half. And by the end of the week, we had like four or five record deals on the table. It was weird. So that band became The Scream. We signed with Hollywood Records and uh, onward and upward from there. Uh, probably the end of 90, all of 91. Um, 
the Scream, but we did our first record with Eddie Kramer, and um, we put the record out, and the first single was Man in the Moon, and I think everybody was like, it was like six minutes long, and I think it was just one of those things where nobody thought it was going get, to get off the ground, and it just wound up getting a ton of radio airplay. Man in the Moon went through the roof. It was like almost 200 stations in America playing it. MTV jumped on the video. They were playing that. And, um, so we started to make a little bit of noise. We, we toured uh, all of the United States with the Bullet Boys. And then we went back to LA and we went right back out again and, and toured again with Dangerous Toys. And uh, at that point, we were out for like four months or five months, and um, we went right back out a third time on our own, and we were just, it was just like building. This thing was building and building and building, and uh, we went over to Europe. We did um, a show at the Astoria Theater in London, and we came back to America and finished our tour. We took a break for the holidays. We went back out again. And then I came home for a break and I got a phone call that changed my life. A fan gave me this magazine called Spin. And Nikki Six was on the cover. And the same thing, he was doing this interview. And at the very end, the guy, whoever he did the interview with, said, So what do you listen to when you're not, you know, whatever? And he went on this long tangent about how much he loved the scream. And uh, it was so weird. I called their management company just to thank Nikki for the plug. And as uh, rumor has it, I, I, that, this is what they told me. But when the day that I was calling in to thank them for the plug, Nikki and Tommy were on the other line talking to Doug Thaler, the manager, saying, I really wish we could get a hold of the guy from The Scream. And they were trying to track me down when I called in and I gave, I don't know if you remember Stephanie that used to work in Top Rock. So I called and she ran into the office. She's like, I got his phone number. He just called. So she gave him my number and I, when I hung the phone up, I was getting ready to go leave and do a gig and the phone rang. They literally called me back in like three minutes. And I, that was a Friday in 1992, February 12th. And um, I, they called me immediately. We chit chatted for a minute. And then they said, listen, dude, we don't want to beat around the bush. Vince is out. They didn't tell me why. Uh, Vince is out. We'd love for you to come down on Monday and audition or jam with us. So I went down on Monday. Um, walked into this room and I sang... Uh, God, I sang... Shot at the Devil, Livewire, Dr. Feelgood. Uh, and then the three covers. Jailhouse Rock, Smoking in the Boys Room, and Helder Skelter. And then they asked me to come back the next day. And um, I went in the next day and we did the same thing. There was a bunch of lawyers and managers and all this other stuff there. And Heather Locklear and Brandy Brandt were there. Um, so I, I, I did the same thing, they all left. Then we started jamming and we actually wrote um, almost all of Hammered and part of the acoustic part of Misunderstood and that's when they said dude you're in you're the guy the one thing I can say you know I, I'm, I'm not I'm not usually a bitter person anyway so I always try to look at things and I know this is it's stupid you know some people look at the glass half empty some look at it half full looking at it half full I, there was only two singers in Motley, me and Vince, and I've gotten, you know, I'm still here almost 30 years later, 25 years later, and whether I like it or not, I'm the other singer from Motley Crue, and, or, you know, and, and it's gotten me, not to sound weird, but I've gotten a lot of extra mileage, I think, out of my career because of it, 
So I have nothing but positive things to say. You know, I had a I had a great time with the guys. I mean, the breakup was a little weird, and only when I say breakup, it wasn't even a breakup. I, they were bringing Vince back. I get it. But the only thing that bothered me in the whole situation was I kind of felt like uh, I, I I kind of felt like I lost a few friends because of it. You know what I mean? Um, and you know how the guys are. You know, when you're in the circle, you are in the circle. And when you're out of the circle, you are out of the circle. You know, and that's the only thing I miss in that whole thing was being able to like hang out and, you know, uh, like just go to a club with my buddies. You know what I mean? Or hang out and go have a beer or whatever. So that, that, that was like the biggest thing. But I had a great time. I'm very proud of the music that we wrote together. Um, and it, like I said, it's it's actually, I, I think in some ways, it's actually, uh, I, I don't want to say enhanced, what, what's the word, Elong, uh, elongated my career. It's, it gave me some longevity. I, I, I remember there was times when I was in the screen where we were incredibly happy and just over the moon about things. And then there was times that we were just bickering and fighting like cats and dogs. So. It's it's kind of who knows if it would have lasted if it, I, who knows if it would have gotten any bigger than it was Maybe I don't know. I mean it was a great band. I loved it. I thought the record that's that record I think is also a great album, you know, but um, Yeah, you know when I left um, um, And joined Motley uh, the Scream went on and got another singer, but it didn't nothing panned out they never wound up doing another record that was released to the public so um, it kind of split the band up I guess um, you know but every, I, I, I truly believe that everything happens for a reason like one door shuts and another one opens and you just kind of follow that path you know so my, my, my path has been a little curvy and a little elong you know uh, is that the right word elongated but um, yeah, it's not bad. it is what it is, you know, it's all good.